Welcome everyone, and we are so very excited to have uh, Vincent here to be talking with us about Black uh, queer identity development as part of our Lunch and Learns, and we are grateful to all of you for joining us. So I want to invite you to join with me in a land acknowledgement at the very beginning. Um, and if you can see at the bottom, placenames.mapdev.ca is the website that we like to use. Uh, please join with me by putting in the chat where you are located so that we can um, collectively acknowledge this unceded territory where we are joining today. I am speaking from Unamagi. This is located in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq whose inherent rights were recognized in the Peace and Friendship Treaties that were signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982, and they remain active to this day. Let us take this time to pause in reflection and gratitude for the land where we live and work. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers commits to translating this acknowledgement into action by seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission call to action, especially those regarding education. We commit to doing what we can to becoming better treaty partners. We commit to learning and to unlearning. Let us take this moment to pause in gratitude for all who have and continue to heroically care and advocate for this beautiful land. May we join them in this sacred work. Let us ground ourselves in the wisdom of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we must all begin to learn. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice, and this community that we share by working for justice for all living beings as an expression of our gratitude for being here. Let us take a deep breath and recenter ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world and fills us. Let us take a deep breath and work on letting go of the unconscious bias that is everywhere, inside and out. May our session today lead us to be in right relationship with this land and with one another. When we acknowledge the land, we must also begin to acknowledge the wisdom of this planet and align ourselves with its truths. Today, we hope that our time together will help us begin. So it is my pleasure to now invite Vincent um, to uh, lead us. I think Vincent may need to um, might need to turn on your camera. There you go. Hi, everybody. Okay. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, so grateful to be here, to be able to present a large portion of the research that I actually did in my master's degree. Um, so I introduce myself first and foremost. Hi, I'm Vincent Musso. You can call me Vince. That's totally fine. Uh, my pronouns are they and them. I am a Black queer and trans community activist uh researcher and social worker um currently based in Jojage, uh which is the uh which is served as a meeting place for many indigenous nations but the ganyan geha are recognized as the keepers of these lands uh and waters i'll take another moment with that in a, uh, in a moment uh before getting started i also want to recognize uh that this research was funded by the social sciences and humanities research council of canada as well as the fond de recherche du québec uh, société et culture um 
I'm very excited to share it with all of you. Uh, this has uh, been the thing that I've been thinking for so long has been missing from my own social work education. And so to be able to provide that now to, to social workers in the field is, is really, it's very humbling. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, of course, I uh, want to recognize that I conducted this research here in Jojage, um, but that the research uh, was actually about Black LGBTQ plus identities in Quebec, and so uh, covered the entirety of the borders of the present day quote unquote province of Quebec, which uh, occupies the territories uh, of 10 First Nations and of the Inuit. Uh, the majority of these, uh, of these uh, communities do not have treaties uh, with uh, the federal government. And so uh, we have to recognize that a large portion of this land and all of this land is also unceded. And that is a responsibility that we as social workers have to contend with. Also reminding folks that Mi'kma'ki includes a part of the borders of modern day Quebec. And so when we're talking about this, we're also talking about parts of Mi'kma'ki. And so really forming and decolonizing our understanding of how borders and colonial borders apply is really key. Um, I really enjoy the statement um, uh, that the NSCSW makes around this. And I also believe that acknowledgement is not very useful if it doesn't come with commitment, especially as social workers are responsible in part, in large part, for a significant overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black youth in the child welfare system. And so, and we need to recognize the ways in which our profession has acted as a colonial tool in order to further this. And so for me, that looks like learning and unlearning growing and fighting for justice for indigenous communities uh, in Mi'kmaq, uh, here at home, as well as across Turtle Island uh, and around the world. Um, I'm gonna pop myself into a little window here, <laughs> a little floaty. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today, why is it important to study the specific population of black LGBTQ plus folks? Um, I'm going to present my research, uh, present the theoretical and methodological frameworks that I use to develop it, as well as uh, a portion uh, specifically on critical reflexivity, which is a large part uh, of, uh, of this research as well, considering that I'm researching my own identities as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the results, the discussions and next steps, and any implications that there might be for social work practice as well. Um, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to use the question and answer section at the uh, at the bottom, and I'd be more than happy to uh, to engage with those questions uh, as they come through. Why this population, first and foremost? Well, it matters. Uh, I should contextualize this. So again, I presented this as part of my master's thesis, which was partial fulfillment of my requirements of my master's degree in social work at the University de Montréal. Um, I um, wanted to understand the specific context of Black LGBTQ plus identity development in Quebec. I think that was very important for me because I also wanted to touch on the linguistic uh, realities. And so understanding the demographics of Black communities in Canada means recognizing as well that there are a disproportionate number of Black people in Canada who are Francophone. Uh, and so that is going to lead to a larger proportion of Black people being located in larger Francophone urban centers like in Quebec, like in Montreal, but also recognizing that a significant uh, impact of that is that language shapes the way that we view the world. And so there are, even in Nova Scotia, uh, a disproportionate number of uh, black folks who are francophone, especially if they are from an immigrant, uh, if they have an uh, immigrant experience. And this is, you know, the history of French colonialism on this territory. This is uh, the impact of uh, linguistic policies that were put into place by federal and provincial governments. And so all of these things were really important. And for me, it was really important also to recognize that this research does not exist in French a lot of the time. And so when we're talking about Black LGBTQ plus identity as in Quebec, but also in places like Nova Scotia, it takes time for research to be translated. And when that research is taking that time, things are progressing. And if we're not producing research in French, we're going to leave us leave aside a large portion of our population that's also going to be able to provide, that is providing services in French, and that will disproportionately affect Black communities. So that's kind of the relevance. You'll also see through the research that the, what I end up coming to is a lot more generalizable than just Quebec. And so the relevance of speaking about it here is not to be understated. I want to start with this quote. Uh, and I think this summarizes why I wanted to do this research. Uh, growing up, it felt like I was too gay to be Black and too Black to be gay. 
Uh, this is an experience that really resonates for me. This is a statement that really resonates to my experiences. Uh, it was either that I needed to fit into these gay, queer communities that were very white, or I needed to fit into black or other racialized communities that were very heterosexual. And there was never really a space for me to become my full self. And what does it mean to interact with spaces and to know that you can never act as your full self? Uh, how does that impact the way that you understand your identity? All of those things. And so that's really what pushed me into this research. Um, and I think it's, this is a really important point to talk about uh, critical reflexivity. So I am a Black queer and trans person. I am doing research on Black queer and trans people and my experience is necessarily going to have an impact on the way that I analyze my results. Uh, I want to first and foremost counter the myth of uh, objective research. Uh, our institutions are not objective. They never could be. The, in the university is a colonial institution uh, that is rooted in racism and white supremacy from its structure. And so there's no there's not necessarily a way that we can extricate ourselves from that context. And so to pretend that there is neutrality is unrealistic. And so I thought, why not use the realities of my lived experience, talking about what I've experienced and trying to have that enter into a dialogue with what uh, happens with my participants and also with the research. And so a key part of this work has really been melding all of that together and I'm through doing that also challenging that colonial structure all while in the colonial institution, uh, which leads me to a discussion of theoretical and, and methodological frameworks, uh, which uh, I spent a lot of time on and I'm very grateful for my supervisor, uh, Annie poulain saint current Canada Research Chair in Transgender Children and Their Families at the University of Montreal for her amazing guidance with this as an ethicist and someone who focuses a lot on methods uh, as well. Um, so I used a pluralistic theoretical framework that was based on interpretative phenomenological analysis or IPA. If this is something that you're not familiar with, I don't blame you. That is a terrible acronym <laughs> and an even worse title. Uh, I will say to kind of give you an idea of what this means, interpretative phenomenological analysis is aims to understand how uh, communities uh, understand and experience uh, their, the phenomenon that they live on a daily basis through their own interpretation. So for example, um, I don't care if the situation that is being described by someone is or is not actually a racist incident, that doesn't matter. Did you live it as a racist incident? Did, it, did you experience it as a racist incident? And if so, what was the impact of that on you? And so I am trying to analyze the interpretation of the phenomena that people are living. So that yeah, so when I say IPA, that's what I mean. Um, I uh, had to integrate a whole bunch of other theories, of course. So I integrated in uh, critical race theory and intersectionality, of which critical race theory, uh, of which uh, which is a large part of critical race theory. Excuse me. Uh, also, resilience theory uh, and herman the idea of hermeneutical injustice. Simply put, you cannot become what you do not know exists. And so this is where we talk a lot about representation and things like that. So that'll come in a bit later in the work. You'll see. Um, IPA also served as a methodological framework, which is very interesting. Um, so the structure of IPA is really aims really to go in depth with very small sample sizes in order to understand how specific uh, things uh, reproduce themselves on a very, very micro scale. And so I did a total of six interviews, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, but uh, it, they were uh, short. Uh, more. The questionnaire was very short at about three questions, but uh, interviews lasted anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours. And so we can imagine that there was a lot of material that was being talked about, a lot of probing, a lot of really trying to understand uh, the narrative. Excuse me as I move myself so we can see a lot of this stuff here. Um, and uh, in doing so, I really thought it would be essential to integrate some of the Afrocentric principles and social work research that were developed by Chambers in um, the book Afrocentric Social Work, with which some of you might be familiar. Um, so we talk about uh, local Afrocentric ways of knowing, uh, the back home model. We also talk about dialectic forms of storytelling. So the ways that in which Black communities uh, culturally have a tendency to, to speak in ways that are a, lot, are a lot more narrative. And that's why these approaches are much more useful with Black communities, especially when we're trying to understand a specific experience. 
Um, also, the representation of local languages was essential. As I mentioned earlier, the linguistic context can be very specific. Um, and finally, the idea that we are co-constructing knowledge. So really, again, moving, leaning into that decolonization of knowledge and pushing away from this idea that there is a tangible research subject and a person who is doing the research and that both arrive with a new neutral posture, not worthwhile. And uh, what we will see in a moment when I show you the posters um, of this um, for this project is really how that came, uh, that was really relevant. Uh, so you can see in the graph below here um, how uh, the analysis was done. And so it was really about engaging with the data, noting things down, developing themes, searching for connections, but then doing that iteratively. And so continually coming back and saying, OK, well, this theme I thought came up in the first interview. I didn't really note it down, but actually I'm seeing a more of a pattern in the second and third and fourth interviews. And so I got to go back and maybe analyze consistently. And so analyzing them individually, but also as a block, as a collective um, and trying to, to like determine patterns. Uh, these were my research um, posters. You'll notice maybe uh, in one of the sections here that I mentioned that the research, uh, there, is a there is a section in which I mentioned that um, I will be doing these interviews and I am a black queer and trans person. And this was essential to this project. Uh, every single person that I spoke to said that they would not have done this interview if I was not the person doing it. If I did not list my social location because there is a really a dynamic where black communities, especially black queer and trans communities have mentioned feeling over-researched and as though this was not actually going to serve their interests. And so these projects are happening and people are researching them and they're doing all these interviews and they're you know, feeling exploited essentially. Uh, and so the idea that I would do this work and come of, be of their community and reproduce this for them was really key. We'll also notice some little things that might be interesting that local members of the community might know that other people might not. So this image in the background here at the top of the research posters is actually taken from Black Lives Matter interrupting Toronto, uh, interrupting Montreal Pride in 2017, uh, the year after they did it in uh, in Toronto in 2016. Uh, and so this is something that community members might recognize uh, and that might let folks know some of the orientation that is going on and the, the involvement in community that is going on. And so we see a lot of like intentional choices meant to adequately and appropriately represent the realities lived by our communities. Boop, boop, boop. Let's talk ethics. Uh, so of course, I uh, had the joy of doing this research right in the middle of uh, of the COVID-19 COVID-19 syndemic. Uh, of course, disproportionately affecting Black communities, disproportionately affect LG, uh, disproportionately also affecting LGBTQ plus folks. And so it was really essential for me that these interviews be done in a way that was safe, uh, and of course also to respect the public health measures that were made uh, that were uh, that were in in place at the time. And also the university uh, at this moment did not allow for in-person uh, research to take place uh, in for these types of interviews. And so, of course, I did the interviews online. However, recognizing essentially as well that this might have uh, re uh, reflected and created a potential impact on recruitment as people who maybe didn't have a safe place to do an interview to talk about their sexual orientation and, and racialization for up to two hours. Uh, if they didn't have a space where that felt comfortable, they might not have been there. And who did we miss? Who would we miss that might not have a space to do that? We miss folks who face extreme levels of marginalization, maybe someone who doesn't have a video, like a camera and uh, a computer where they could do a Zoom session. Maybe their only internet access is the library. So, you know, there are things, there are impacts that we need to consider, especially around uh, uh, access relating to class, especially around access relating to um, uh, the housing and poverty and all these things, so essential. And let's talk about the results. So um, the demographics of my sample, uh, I had a total of six people. Uh, I had uh, three people who uh, identified as cis women, two, two people who identified as cis men, uh, and one person who was non-binary and transmasculine. You'll note here, and I think this is really essential, a uh, lack of representation of Black trans women. Uh, this is a population that faces extreme levels of marginalization due to the intersection of, of uh, anti-Blackness, 
the intersection of homophobia, transphobia, as well as transmisogyny, and specifically transmisogyny noir. And so all of these things interacting together creates a very specific set of barriers that unfortunately in my sample, I was not able to, uh, to, to deal with. But this is a, a significant uh, population that we really need to, uh, con uh, over which we need to really consider the realities, especially in relation to those multiple things of issues of marginalization. You'll notice as well that five out of six participants were located in Montreal. So a map of Quebec here with the administrative regions that I'm referring to. Montreal is the island right in the center here, the largest city in Quebec. One person is in Utahue. This is number seven here, um, right? It, the Utahue region is right across the border from Ottawa. And so that region is very interesting and actually shifted the, my understanding of my own research now because uh, it is a border region. So people are, moving from Quebec into Ontario and vice versa, multiple, sometimes multiple times a day. And so that border is very porous, but it also has something to do with the access to services. So you have a different health card from a different province. Is it going to be accepted in the same way? Will you have access to the same services as a non-resident? So a lot of things to kind of ask there. Um, you'll see that like all of the participants also were given uh, names. These are not, of course, their real names. They were changed. Um, and yeah. Uh, a lot of diversity in this sample that I'm very happy with otherwise, other than the lack of representation of Black trans women. This is an important time to present as well Hunter's model of Black gay identity development. Um, so Hunter uh, had this idea that uh, identity development in Black gay men could be largely placed into three categories. The interlocking category, Black gay, as he worded it, uh, so these are, these are identities that I could never separate like one from the other. So my blackness and my gayness are intrinsically put together and one cannot exist without the other. Uh, the up down model would have people prioritize and create a hierarchy of their identities. So this would be someone saying, well, I feel black first and then gay, or maybe gay first and then black. Um, and so that really the creation of that hierarchy. And then you have the public private model. The public private model basically points out that, well, blackness is visible in most circumstances. And so it's an identity over which I do not have control uh, as to whether or not it's visible. As opposed to queerness and gayness in this context, <coughs> excuse me, which I can, I do have control over who I wanna share that information with. And so it's less about shame it's, uh, and, uh, or disdain about one's queer identity. It's more so about an idea that I can choose what parts of my identity to show and to not show. So this is more so about a dynamic of power rather than one of shame and, and this you know idea that there is like a, a latent homophobia that might exist. Um, that is not to say that uh, internalized homophobia might not be present, but it is to say that that dynamic of internalized homophobia is, uh, is not the reason why people are going and making that choice. Um, so of course, this study has limitations. It focuses on gay men first and foremost. So it is kind of, but it is kind of helpful to understanding how Black LGBTQ plus people might understand their identities. And so I used this framework as well and tried to basically understand the experiences that folks put in through the lens of this of these uh, of this model and tried to see what came of it and if it would apply. So I share a whole bunch of quotes. I'm not going to read all of them. Um, I'm actually just going to disconnect because there's a lot of quotes here. Separate. There we go. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, a few separate types. Uh, there are a few pages with quotes. I'm not going to read all of them, but I will read some of the ones where I'm talking about what actually came of this. So we can see uh, when people are talking about the up-down identity model, Mateo is quoted and saying, I'm really more identifying with my sexuality and with being gay. In the Caribbean, there's almost, there's a separation between the two. Like I had to keep private this identity as being gay. And I almost felt in some way that it was foreign to who I was more because I knew I couldn't suppress it, but at the same time to embrace it. In the Caribbean, for example, my sexuality was harmful in terms of the discrimination I faced. So we can see that the experiences of discrimination that Mateo faced in this circumstance ends up actually pushing them to identify more with their queerness as a way to reclaim agency over it and to say, uh, this was something that was harmful. And so uh, as opposed to my blackness, which in the Caribbean, of course, might not have been as much of an issue. Um, and so being present here and having to understand your identity and to ask be asked to like create a hierarchy almost, you would prioritize your gay identity. Um, that being said, there was also the interlocking identity model. And so that was the first one that we discussed. 
Um, I'm going to actually take a moment and translate the bottom quote because I believe it to be really essential. Uh, and excuse my language in this because there is an, there is some slurs, but that is, this is a direct quote. I remember one time in a bar in Montreal. I was with my white friends and I was the only black person. It was in the winter and I was wearing a sort of uh, like a shirt that was, you know, cut a little crop top style. But when I went in, the, 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 the people at the door didn't recognize that I didn't notice this because I was wearing a winter jacket. And all of a sudden, you know, we decided to go outside and have a break with some friends and smoke a cigarette and we didn't take our coats. And then I'm wearing, you know, my fashionable crop top and I get out and the, the, the door, the person at the door, black, just as I am, came up to us and said, if you go out like this, it's, you're like, it's because you're not a real N-word. <laughs> I was so uh, angry. I said, watch me. But that doesn't mean that I didn't think about it for a long time. And when I talked about it with my white friends, they also thought it was really problematic. I didn't think it was okay, like really not okay. And so what is this way of speaking to another person, especially to another black person? It's obviously not appropriate. And so it is clear to me over experiences like this that I cannot dissociate my, for me in my state, the fact that I am queer, uh, the, my, the fact that I am gay and the fact that I am black, because in all circumstances, the comments that come after, there's always a reminder um, that there, uh, it's, there's, sorry, there are always these two dimensions of my personality that are put into one. And so we see how the interlocking model really gets explained here, where it's like, I cannot separate one identity from the other, because when I face homophobia, it is racialized. And when I face racism, it is tainted with homophobia, is the idea that this person is expressing here. So, Coming up this, there were a few barriers uh, that were identified in uh, developing a cohesive Black LGBTQ plus identity. First and foremost, people talk a lot about how their experiences were either erased or essentialized. So we can see in the top quote here that representation was a big issue. If the media is, where it, uh, is what it is now, when I was growing up, it would have helped a lot. Even just, you know, seeing women of color being gay, huge difference. I didn't know I was gay because I thought it was impossible. I thought it was... Like, I thought I was overthinking things. I felt like, oh, it's just admiration because you want to look like her. I created a false sense, a false narrative of what it means to be attracted to people. And so we really understand this is where hermeneutical injustice came in. This idea of like, because I didn't know that it was possible for me to be like this, I could, I do, did not lean into that because I didn't know that I could. Uh, and once, and that representation would have created, in this person's opinion, in Sarah's opinion, would have created a... Uh, and it would have allowed her to understand her identity a lot more quickly. Um, and so in the second quote, we also have someone saying about how, you know, they, it's just when they had a colleague at work around 22, 23 years old, then they realized that this might be a possibility for them. And so we see the importance of being visible and actually asking questions and also challenging the assumptions that all black people must be necessarily straight and all like queer people must be necessarily white because um, it does have an impact on folks. Um, of course, there are as well intersectional forms of oppression that people interact with. Um, I think Mateo's quote here is really interesting. Um, he was mentioning how he could not fit into gay communities because uh, of his religious background and being a religious person. And uh, that really controversy also was very difficult for him. I remember him saying uh, how... Uh, Queer people have been hurt so much by church, by religion, that it is a normal, it's a normal reflex to want to pull away. But that does not mean that his identity as a religious person who is also queer should be invalidated. And so that was a really uh, important uh, dynamic to consider and that there are also all of these other factors that come into play. Um, of course, anti-Black racism <laughs> is a significant barrier to uh, understanding of uh, and having a cohesive Black LGBTQ plus identity. Um, and it, again, translate this uh, this quote up top from Usman, who honestly was amazing. It was like, you're doing my analysis for me, but I love it. Uh, so I asked about experiences of racial fetishization. Uh, he said, um, it does change the understanding that I have of LGBTQ plus society. Uh, the objectification of black people, hyper fetishization. It's not just in Quebec that I've experienced this. It's also in other provinces and other countries. It's kind of this general idea that white people have about black people. This idea, it's almost like a spectra, a specter of colonization. 
this idea that black people are always studied under a different lens, always trying to prove that there are distinctions between us as human beings, between black people and white people, um, with the objective of dehumanizing uh, or uh, making us feel inferior compared to white people. But in a sexual context that has been characterized by the popular belief that black men all have large penises and this, these fantasies of large penises, when you see a black man who on his profile, it's written bottom and you still write to him and send him photos, uh, asking him photos for, uh, for photos of his, uh, of his butt and asking if he has a big dick, but we all know what bottom means, this person says. Uh, and uh, I thought this is a really good uh, explanation and example of the ways that even when we say we are something, the racial stereotype is going to take the to take the forefront here and say, you know, you have to be this because this is the image that I have of black men uh, in this case. And of course, various forms of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, et cetera, also impact people. One person actually said that experiencing homophobia from black communities uh, made her feel as though, uh, made her develop a feeling of internalized racism and how uh, she had a hard time fitting in and being accepted and recognized as a black person. And the quote, and you guys throw me away because of this. It, it pierces my heart every time. This idea of like, I face so much racism and my community is not able to help me with that because of homophobia and transphobia, it's, 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 it's painful to hear. And of course there are significant barriers in accessing resources that are available. Um, so one person was, make, was referencing the West Island, an area of Montreal, an area on the island of Montreal that is uh, further to the west, as you might imagine, that's kind of a bit uh, more of like a, an on-island suburb in a lot of ways, and transit might be a little bit difficult and to access to get downtown. So someone mentioned, you know, being in the West Island and coming to Montreal and being able to access stuff uh, was important, and how uh, they the lack of services there, quote unquote, the West Island did not really tell me anything about myself other than that I was deeply suffering, and I didn't know what to do with that. And so the lack of access to resources, both in terms of like, how am I going to get transit to get down here? Let's to make a Nova Scotian example. We're thinking about the youth project, which doing amazing work, uh, especially recently, super happy to see it. Uh, when the youth project is out here centered in the North End, how are we getting youth from North Preston out to the services there? When transit has been cut significantly by Halifax Transit. So we understand that all of these barriers that we might initially see as class-based issues are also queer issues, are also racialized issues. When we see Halifax Transit cutting bus service to areas like North Dartmouth, that issue is racialized and it's going to have disproportionate effects on queer and trans communities, for example, uh, because especially because of access issues like this and especially because of the barriers that we see in terms of, ac in terms of uh, access to adequate financial resources as well. But I really hate painting this picture that is super negative uh, about our identities. Uh, Black queer identities, and this is where I'm gonna get on a high horse a little bit, are the source of so much of modern queer culture. And we do it in the face of systemic marginalization. Uh, I wanna share a quote from this wonderful book, Black Joy, uh, Stories of Resistance, Resilience and Restoration by Tracy Michael Lewis Gigas. Um, who talks about this exact dynamic and uh, I think is really useful for me in understanding this and taking and really countering this narrative of harm and how uh, and of victimization that is often placed on Black queer and trans people. When we choose Blackness, which as I've stated here might mean choosing unacceptance, it's glorious. When we decide to wrap our hearts, our arms tight around what Blackness means to us, hold it, love it, and yes, even interrogate it, then we snatch that construct back out of the hands of those who, who thought they had the power to use it to make us inferior. We say, give me that blackness and let me show you what I will do with it. Let me roll it between my fingers and in my mind. Let me set your intentions on fire and create something new, something that as colonizers you'll desperately want later on. Let me create the baseline that holds your na national melody together. I see you coming to steal it. But as soon as you do, I'll flip it again and you'll need to overhaul your systems just to catch up. I will turn my gospel into blues, into jazz, into R&B, into rock, into funk, into disco, into hip hop. You'll look back over entire industries and when you remove the mask, you'll only see our joy behind that creativity. 
We will lean into your non-acceptance no matter how much it hurts because deep down, we know that on your best day, you could never. That quote for me is very powerful. And I see someone requesting it in the comments. So I will pop it in the chat for you here. Great, I was just getting ready to ask. Lewis, it gets, the book is called Black Joy. So first and foremost, the idea of where a person develops their identity is really key. And so I had this, so I found this person here who talked about their arrival in Quebec and really understanding how the resource, the differences in resources that were available here created a significant, allowed this person to reflect on, well, how do I fit into this society? They say, I feel like I'm fully accepted in who I am, but at the same time, I'm still trying to find the safe space that would help me fully live out my, that sexuality, having now accepted who I am. And I'm still trying to navigate the world in terms of which settings I can fully feel safe to do that. And so we see through quotes like this, that this person is saying, I was able to understand my identity more through my presence here. That doesn't mean that all the barriers are gone. That doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but it does mean that I'm better equipped to understand these barriers. Um, another person that I uh, interviewed at this point actually said this really interesting perspective. So they were from France originally and lived in uh, and lived in Quebec. And they mentioned that queer was not an identity that was used very much in France. And so when they came here and they discovered the way that queer was used, they chose to identify more with that identity rather than a lesbian identity. And so that choice to identify as queer essentially came from their presence in Quebec and will continue to influence their identity even if they choose to leave Quebec. And so really important to recognize that the space in which we create and understand these identities will allow us then to, uh, to shift our understandings of ourselves in ways that we might not have had if we stayed in another place. And so this is what I'm really talking about when it comes down to that. And how we create spaces that are affirming is going to have a direct impact on a person's ability to understand themselves more fully. Um, of course, community organizations were also seen as a massive step towards empowerment. Um, so this one, joining a different community helped me to realize that no, I don't have to act a certain way to be loved. I can be loved just for who I am as a person. And I don't have to run away from parts of my identity in order to justify a sense of belonging and love. Ah, uh, every time, just right in the heart. Um, this, uh, these posters on the side here are, uh, Rezo is a, is a community-based organization that serves gay and bisexual men, as well as other men who have sex with men in the greater Montreal region. Uh, I worked with them on a project funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada on um, a community consultation with Black, queer, and trans communities uh, in order to understand why Black men who have sex with men were not accessing services. Uh, at this organization, spoiler alert, racism. Um, and so they ended up deciding to develop a whole new program based on this project, as well as to develop an anti-racism campaign specifically targeted at queer and trans people that aim to understand this. So Communauté, which means community in Haitian Creole, uh, is the name of this group where uh, there are closed discussion groups for Black, gay, and bisexual men to connect with each other and to create community space that uh, have been very, very successful. They've had two uh, iterations already and it's been wonderful and they're getting ready for a third and I'm yeah very much uh very proud of my child uh and uh this other poster here is one against sexual racism so one of the recommendations of the report that I gave them was that they develop a campaign to address this and uh, you can see in the in this title here uh this reads uh blacks are all uh are all stallions is the same thing as saying black men are all thieves and so it's really about challenging that idea of like sexual racism as not being a real form of racism, especially when it's done in a way that fetishizes a person. It's like, no, I'm expressing interest. It's like, yes, but that interest is based on racialized stereotypes that dehumanize me, that make me feel not like a person. I'm rather just an object that fulfills your sexual fantasy. And so that was seen as a significant uh, factor for folks uh, in, in this research. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it is in my thesis. Um, I believe a recent study from 2016 uh, asked Black, gay, and bisexual men about their relationships with white people, and they said that around 80-some percent of Black men, uh, Black, queer, and trans men uh, who were interviewed thought that, their, that white people were only approaching them because of the color of their skin. And that was the impression that they got from 80% of their, approximately 80% of their interactions. How would that taint like shift the way that you view your own sexuality and your own worth. 
so key conversations for us to be having. Also, the idea that we can build networks of community within our, uh, with, with, between ourselves that are really key uh, is a really key part of this. And so someone, Joshua here actually mentions that some of the really good experiences that, they, that they've had have come from being, like, feeling seen in spaces where they might have assumed that they wouldn't have been seen. So being uh, seen and appreciated and having their gender validated at a funeral or a wedding with family or in a church, you know, and being seen uh, shifted and reaffirmed their identity and allowed them to exist fully in a space. So when an identity is not only tolerated, but affirmed and recognized, and it's just treated like this is not up for debate, it's not a question, allowed people to lean more into their own identities and their own feelings of community and help them to see themselves as a more cohesive person with a cohesive identity. And of course, there is the reclamation of power and agency, which is, I would say, the pillar, the hallmark of Black communities and the strength that exists within our communities. And I'm so happy with this quote. I actually just gave, I presented this research at a conference in, in Glasgow, and uh, I translated this quote as the title of my presentation because I think it, it got everything for me. I have a right to happiness. I have a right to, to, to development. I have a right to affirm my identity, just as every other person on this planet. This is a right that will always be inalienable. But I am also aware that uh, not everyone has enough courage to face the judgment that comes from their own community. <laughs> it's, a, it's a powerful one. So what do we do with all this? Well, in terms of, first of all, I wanna go back to Hunter's model of black identity development. About half of the people in my sample, as I mentioned, understood their identities as being comparable to the interlocking model. The other half kind of were more in the up-down model with all three of those cases being people who prioritize their LGBTQ plus identity over their black identity. And I wanna take a moment and recognize why that might be. So of course, number one is that there are issues with sampling. Uh, so the main way that I put out these posters in the context of COVID was yes, in community spaces, but also online. And my connections are more connected to Black LGBTQ plus communities, or to more, like, more to LGBTQ plus communities than to Black communities. And I think the relationships that I may or may not have had with folks in Black community organizations, especially outside of Montreal, might have been like, well, maybe we're not going to share these posters. Maybe we're not going to put this on. Or maybe I didn't do enough in order to uh, ask, the, uh, in order to ensure that the posters were appropriate for their, for their community settings, et cetera, et cetera. And so... I really want to highlight that that is a significant possibility and that this, I would say, is not representative of the community's likelihood to identify in a certain way or another. Also, none of the participants identified with the public-private model. I'm not really sure why that might have been, but uh, I'm very much hoping to look into that in my uh, current doctoral research. Um, so, of course, social marginalization has significant impacts on Black communities. Uh, I feel like that goes without saying, pretty simple. Uh, of course, hermeneutical injustice, number one. Uh, so this idea, again, of you cannot become what you do not know exists is has a significant impact on uh, con and contributes significantly to the social marginalization of black LGBTQ plus people because it means that we are not able to identify what is possible for us. And so the importance of representation, and I'm to be clear, not leaning into an idea of representation is going to save everything because it definitely will not. Uh, but this idea that uh, we need to be represented in media is really key here. We also need to ensure that community resource supports, as I mentioned earlier, are accessible, are much more accessible to people, <clears throat> that people feel as though they have uh, the ability to access a space, et cetera, et cetera. A person might, for example, have a bus route that might take them directly where they need to go, but if it takes you an hour and a half to get there and get back and it only runs during rush hour, is it really that accessible for you? Uh, we also have those feelings of rejection and alienation that contribute effective, uh, largely to this. I think we all know this. We are social creatures. We are social beings as humans. This is why we do the work that we do as social workers. We recognize the inherent humanity of that social connection. And when we feel rejected, when we feel alienated from our communities, we're contributing largely to losing that, uh, to, to, to marginalizing those communities. Uh, I want to give you an experience that I've had in this city, in Halifax, actually. I just spent a couple of days in Halifax on my way back. And uh, I have had an unbroken streak from the 18 months that I was living in Halifax and doing my PhD coursework, as well as 
past few days, unbroken streak, and I have never had a white person sit next to me on the bus, ever, in Halifax. And I, now that I mention it, I will encourage you all who take trans, public transit, especially in Halifax, to take a look at that and notice it around you, because you will see it. I'd also encourage you to think about the fact that whenever there's a bus stop, uh, when you're at the bus stop and there's a white person and a black person, the bus will almost always stop in front of the white person. Uh, I've not, I've noticed the significant amounts of time. And so even these little moments of social marginalization reinforce this idea that this place is not for you. And we've already understood the importance of place in this, right? And so being able to feel as though you are of this place in order to understand your identity through the lens of that place is key. And so all of these impacts. And so when I say racial justice is a queer issue, I mean it in that lens. Racial justice is a queer issue because I cannot separate my racialization from my queerness. And that is going to contribute to this culture of rejection and alienation that it can be really damaging for LGBTQ plus folks of color. Uh, and of course, there is state sanctioned marginalization and violence. I could, of course, not mention this with uh, not mention all of this research without talking about the effects of Bill 2 in Quebec as well at this moment. Um, at this time, uh, at the time when I was doing this research, rather, the government of Quebec had proposed legislation that would basically make it so that instead of allowing people to change their sex designation on their documents. They would allow people to change their sex designation only if they've had gender affirming uh, surgeries, uh, but would add a gender categorization that would have M, F, and X as options, which was of course absurd, would have set trans rights back about 15 years in the province. And if, luckily through community mobilization was stopped, but one of the participants in my research and content warning uh, one of the participants in my research told told us about uh, another Black trans person who took their life as a result of not feeling as though they belonged in the society and thinking about all the social marginalization they already face and then thinking about what impact it would have to on them to have to go to a doctor's office and not and always have the wrong sex designation on your document because you don't want certain amounts of gender affirming care or certain types of gender affirming care. It's violent. It is straight up violent. And that impact is going to disproportionately affect our communities. But again, I don't focus on negativity in that way exclusively. Yes, I will name the negative, but my life is not defined by that negativity. Uh, so community organizations play, of course, an essential role. We understand that they can be spaces of development and resilience as well, uh, as well as informal support networks. And so groups get created despite the failings of community organizations, groups get created in order to organize. We can see this in Halifax, not within Black communities. We saw this in Halifax after, um, with uh, the group Queer Arabs of Halifax, uh, who was facing a whole bunch of stuff with Halifax Pride back in the 2016, 2017-ish, uh, and how folks really banded together and created their own net inform more informal networks of community support in order to address the forms of social marginalization and, and violence that were being perpetrated by groups like Halifax Pride and others. And of course, the reclamation of agency. I have a right to be happy. I have a right to exist. I will, I will defend that right uh, to exist and to say, this is who I am and I will live that identity irrespective of what you think is such a form of power uh, that is rooted in agency and that agency is essential. Let's talk about some implications. I was hoping to have a bit more of a discussion about this, but considering the time, considering the format, I don't think that's going to be a really big possibility. Let's talk implications. Some of the implications that I see are that social workers specifically need to understand the intersection, the ways that uh, intersectionality is going to make uh, Black LGBTQ plus people face specific barriers within healthcare. Uh, and access to healthcare and social services and, and all of these things. So in all the settings in which we engage, all of these things might represent significant barriers. I also want to divest from this idea that one must lean into colonial and structures of queerness and trans identity in order to uh, understand oneself fully. The notion of you need to come out of the closet. When you come out, you're going to come out in this way. You must speak to your parents in this way. If they don't accept you, you can leave them aside. You can push them away. You will create their community elsewhere is a vision of queerness that is rooted in whiteness and doesn't recognize that, especially in smaller communities, disconnection from family and friends might also mean complete disconnection from culture. And culture is important to people. And that decision needs to be made in way, and the, the way that we talk about to Black, queer, and trans people about 
affirming their queer and trans identities is going to necessarily be different depending on the other social contexts in which that person finds themselves. And so it's really essential that when we're doing our intervention work, we we seek to challenge that form of like colonialism and this uh, normativity that gets created around Western queer and trans identities and really think about, well, how might this represent a barrier for someone aiming to access services? How might this uh, create, uh, how might uh, experiencing racism in a very queer setting, for example, shift someone's uh, comfort level identifying in a, in a certain way. So again, I'm thinking about a moment uh, that I had when doing some work with the, with the youth project in Halifax. And I mentioned to these folks, and, I, and again, I'm sorry for this, this content warning, but I, I, it's, it's really key here. Before the youth project started doing the amazing work that they are doing around the radical inclusion of racialized people in their community organizations, aiming to like rectify that like significant community uh, lack of community engagement, um, I went to them and I said, "If a black person walk, if a black youth walks into this organization and sees no black it, this, if a black youth from Uniac Square, for example, right next to the, the the YP's house, if a black youth walks into that service and sees no black youth present." sees no black staff present, sees no black people on the board, sees no black people on the youth board. And that kid looks at themselves and they say, well, I guess being gay is a white thing. I guess that's true. And goes home and they end their, they choose to end their life. That blood is with you because you chose not to take action. You chose that this was not a priority for your organization in this moment. And I want to make you aware of the impact of what you are doing. And I cannot think of another way to do this other than to highlight a very real, very possible scenario that could happen in this context. And I really want to undermine, underline here that not actively considering the realities that Black, queer, and trans people face in your work when working with Black, queer, and trans people creates the conditions that further our marginalization. And as a Black queer and trans person here, I will tell you that I do not accept that as a status quo. I do not accept the idea that my identity is something that should be taught in an elective class. I don't believe that it is reasonable to expect that you will be able to learn everything about Black queer and trans identities through a one hour lunch and learn provided by your college. I don't believe that without adequate and, ref and consistent interaction with Black queer theory, with Black feminist theory, that we will be able to create the conditions that are necessary for queer liberation, for racial justice in the society. And if we're not engaging with these notions, we are failing. And that is why we are here. And that is the origin in which I put my research, that's the context in which I put my research. Um, I'm so immensely grateful for the opportunity to present that research to you. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to having a conversation with you about that uh, over the next couple of minutes while we take some questions. And thank you so, so much for having me. Uh, yeah. Thank you so very much. And this is a shout out to anyone who wants to put a question in the chat. Um, I did get one question that was looking at um, the what seems to be a split between um, people who identify as Black and people who identify as queer, and that within each community, there's the experience of stigma. And what does that mean in terms of holistic identity development? Mm -hmm. How can a therapist help someone heal when they are constantly feeling like part of themselves are not welcome? For example, their family or their church community is rejecting them or they walk in and don't see representation? Absolutely. Uh, I don't know that there's an answer to that, to be honest. I think it's it's so painful to exist in that space where you have a lack of representation on one side and the other. I think one of the best things that we can do in our role as helping professionals is really to lean into this idea that Sometimes we're not the best people to respond to this scenario. But what does community resource? What does community action look like? What are the resources that are available that you might not be might not know of as uh, maybe a non-black or non-queer and or trans practitioner? So really referring people to services that they know are that you know might be adapted. And if not, what does empowering your clients to be able to take the action to create the community spaces that they need look like? Uh, our communities are resilient. 
and they have always had to be. And as much, and I, I, I want to I mean, many of the social workers here are familiar with the fact that Michael Unger development of resilience theory is actually based at Dow. Um, I have a lot of beef with resilience theory, not in like a, not because I don't think it's accurate or useful. I believe I read we use it a lot, uh, but I don't like the idea that we need to develop resilience at all. I would rather have people work towards a society in which we do not need to develop the resilience in the first place. I would love to not have to live the hardships that are required that develop my resilience, while also at that same time recognizing that I'm so very grateful that my communities have had the ability to develop that in that way. And so really considering how, and that many of the tools and many of the lingo and slang that we might know in queer communities, yes, mama, work the house down, boots, queen, et cetera, et cetera, all of that comes from Black trans women. That's all ballroom culture from New York City in the 1970s and 80s and 90s uh, at the peak of the AIDS crisis, fighting against a world that did not care if they lived or died. And so first and foremost, you will treat that community with respect. You will treat those terms with respect because they are the, they are the products of my resistance. And I do not accept anything less, but also that tool is something that we created for ourselves and we are resilient and we will continue to be resilient. And so what does empowerment look like that will, and what does it look like to show up and act in allyship with communities, act in solidarity with communities uh, in order to allow them to counter the systemic marginalization that makes those tools very difficult to access in the first place. I hope that answers that question maybe. <laughs> Thank you, yes. And um, hopefully you are, getting some of the uh, love that's coming at you from emojis in the chat. And uh, I'm so grateful that you ended on that note on allyship because uh, Vincent is going to be back. So uh, we will get to continue to learn from them. And hopefully um, all of you will continue to uh, be inspired to learn and join us in fighting against the intersectional oppression that uh, impacts us all. Thank you for helping us have a more expanded understanding and hopefully this is just the beginning of people's unlearning. And, of course, I also uh, pop my email in the chat. I'm not going to read it out loud because I know this is going to go on YouTube. Yes. Uh, but if you have any <laughs> questions uh, or anything about my research or you'd like to, and if you, I haven't translated this into French, into English, but if you are comfortable reading 140 pages of academic French, I can definitely send you a link to access the thesis uh, if that might be relevant for you as well. Well, we have some uh, French speakers amongst us. Uh, so, merci pour tout ton travail. On, on est tout reconnaissant. And thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful day. And we look forward to continuing to learn from you, Vincent. Thank you. Merci.